Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Irit Ezips, and I am a consultant at CSM Practice. It's a strategy consulting firm specializes in customer success. And this podcast is about best practices in customer success and how do real life customer executives and professionals solve common issues that all of us typically see at some point in our customer success career. And today I have a Adi Aloni from Follows and she's the head of customer success there. And one of the things that she dealt with was, you know how sales sometimes likes to close a lot of deals. And in this instant, they close so many deals that some of them you could kind of tell from day one that they're not going to be successful. It was this weird use case. And the reason I brought her over is because I have heard this problem again and again. And at some point, somebody posted on one of those social media forums for customer success about this question. And Adi raised her hand and said, oh, I know what to do about this. So Adi, thank you for coming in and kind of sharing your story and your experience on how do you deal with a bunch of salespeople just closing deals and you're kind of getting them and like, what am I supposed to do with this? This is not even what this tool is all about. This product is all about. And now you have to handle this weird use cases and customization requests. Tell me, what was your world like before you solved it? What were the main challenges when sales just closing these random deals that are not, <laughs> should have never been closed, let's put it this way. Well, thanks for having me first. Always happy to be here and talk to you and talk to the audience. I think that my starting point is that I'm really lucky to be in a company that understands that customer success is a company goal and not a department goal. So in that sense, I have really good partners in the executive team, in sales, in marketing that really understand the, the impact of customer success and the impact of not being able to make a customer successful. So our starting point is really not confrontational. It's very collaborative. With that, we analyzed our churn in 2021. And we realized that a lot of those deals that churned had non-ideal starting point. And there are some things that we could predict that will not go well in the deployment. And that's where we went back and looked at our ideal customer profile and how do sales apply ICP to the deals that they close. Let's give the audience some content here or context rather. Follows has tens, hundreds, tens of thousands of new customers every year. We're actually looking at hundreds. So our we mainly go after the larger end of the mid-size and the enterprise companies. So that's initially, even before we did the ICP analysis, this was our target audience. We are, just for context, like you said, we are a marketing technology company. We have a no-code buyer experience platform that is used by B2B marketers. One of the main use cases that customers are using follows for is account-based marketing, which is a practice that became pretty common in B2B marketing in the last eight to five years, but really got established in the last few years. Got it. Well, hundreds of customers, that's quite a big of a number. And I would say to know that what is the reason why customers are not successful in year two, or what is the main reason for churn in year one for hundreds of accounts, that takes some discipline. So Maybe first of all, what would you recommend a customer success executive that has hundreds or thousands of accounts every year, like new accounts that they need to onboard, and they have a significant number of them that's like, don't even renew after year one or year two. How do you go about analyzing what are the reasons? Do you do it in Excel? How do you come up with the reason categories? My first suggestion is to keep it as simple as possible. I know that there's a whole practice of measuring customer health, and I know it, those models can get really, really complicated. For our analysis, we decided to find like what are the three main factors that impact our ability to make a customer successful. We decided intentionally to keep it very simple. 
also everyone across the company finds it easy to understand and apply. And then it's also about how easy it is to get the information. So some information like firmographics is easier to get if you, for example, if you have tools like Inside View and Zoom Info and those you can easily download the firmographic information. For us also, we looked at what other tools those customers have in addition to, to follows. And that's again, information that is relatively easy to, to come by. And then you add on that the factors that are not easily pulled from other systems and are more subjective or more dependent on your specific business and specific use cases. Okay. So you're talking about first step that you've done, you knew that there was some issue, there were some deals that were coming in that were not ideal. And you're thinking, okay, I don't know why they're not ideal, but I'm going to look at different factors and I'm going to keep it super simple. I was expecting that you will actually look at usage or things that happen during onboarding. But you're saying, no, I actually looked at Zoom info and said, what are the attributes of clients? What is like the, you know, attributes that are common for clients that didn't do well in year one or two. And you looked at customer size, what other systems they've had, just simple attributes like that. So that's surprising. And yet not surprising because in your DNA follows is expert in marketing. So the other advantage is that first of all, you have access to all that information and B, it's like in the in your DNA, everybody kind of understands what is ideal customer profile as a concept. So when you go do that, you had less explaining to do, but I I really love that you took that approach and you surprised me, of course, as well. So that was pretty cool. Did you take a look at anything that happened during the sales cycle besides looking at Zoom info type of attributes? I just want to reference for a second your comment about what was our starting point. If you look at the commonalities between the accounts that churned, we saw some issues that like all of them had adoption issues. All of them had some of those challenges that caused us to say, okay, there is something deeper that we need to look for that is probably causing all those accounts to have adoption challenges. So once you look at the commonalities on multiple different dimensions, you start to understand where you have to dig deeper. And that's where we looked at, okay, we need to add some attributes that are not directly related to the deployment itself, but are more broad than that. So did you look at yeah. like geography, industry, size of the account? I can imagine, like you, you mentioned other software that they had. Did you look at anything else in terms of analyzing like what's common to all of them? So definitely size is a factor that for us is is very important. The reason that we started looking at other tools is that we saw the challenges that customers brought up to us. So what kind of, of integrations that they were looking for? Let me take one, maybe half a step back. In B2B marketing, and I think in other areas as well, but technology stacks exploded over the last like 10 years. There are so many tools. There are tens of tools that B2B marketing team is using in order to get everything that they need done. And one of the things that that those tools can indicate to you as a marketing vendor is where is this customer in their own maturity curve? Where do I fit in as a tool? Maybe I'm a tool for very early stage Maybe I'm a tool for later stage. And that's a really good indicator of the maturity of the tech stack of the customer. And that's something that we realized through analyzing what customers asked from us, what tools they asked to integrate with, Mm -hmm. and what tools we saw them mentioning a lot, even if it's not in the context of, of using follows. Actually, that makes a lot of sense because I would think that enterprise companies, the incumbents, might be using more traditional tools that are more expensive. And so they really need a lot of integration already built in with those. But as soon as you expand your customer base and you're also embracing the SMBs, just as an example, right? Like large organizations, if they had a CRM system, it's most likely going to be either Salesforce or Microsoft CE. But as you go through like really small startups, they might be using, I don't know, Pipedrive, 
look into other solutions. Back in yeah. the day, like five years ago, they would use HubSpot. Now even larger companies right. are using HubSpot. But that's that's kind of like what are you Correct. alluding to? You're going to have all these random, smaller, almost free tools. And now because they're your customer, all of a sudden you need to have the same R&D attention to integrations with solutions that are for lower volume deals. First of all, there's less of them. They're less profitable, but you're still putting all this effort from a services standpoint and R&D standpoint to offer the same experience to something that's not as lucrative. So I think that's where you were kind of alluding to. What are the integrations that our most successful customers have? What is the main app? Right. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, so you went through <laughs> all this exercise and you analyzed all the deals that churn. Did you analyze all the deals that churned in year one or two, or did you analyze all the deals that were churned? Not at all, and not only the ones that churn. So okay. we looked, I think, two years back, all the different deals that we had. We looked at which of them renewed and expanded. So we wanted to also make sure that we analyze the successful accounts, not only the unsuccessful accounts, along the same dimension. Got it. So you benchmark very successful yeah. accounts with high adoption. What are the common attributes for those versus... Correct. Not necessarily churn, but maybe not expended, having adoption issues. What are the commonalities for those? And you looked at attributes outside the account. So my other question from before was, did you also look at what was different in the way that the sales process was handled? So instead of just looking at having this exercise to lead into ICP, I would say my gut feeling like at first off, like if I get a lot of bad deals as a customer success executive, I would say they're like a particular salesperson that constantly bringing us those. Uh, so did you look at, is there like a specific sales reps that are causing these issues or specific things that are skipped in the sales process and that's what leads into it or an improper sales handoff? Do you also look at that? Interesting that you mentioned sales handoff because that's another factor that we definitely put a lot of focus on, but that was after. I think in general, we have a pretty homogeneous sales process and we didn't see like significant differences in terms of one person, one sales rep versus another sales rep. We came to it really from a point of view. And like I said, I had really good support from our VP of sales that was fully bought into this process on, okay, how do we need to help the sales team get to the right deals? So it was a very, like I said, a very collaborative process. And we wanted to come to it from a sales enablement standpoint. Okay. So I'm going to say this, some companies that have a bad deal issue, it could be that they have the right ICP and then there's like one rogue sales rep that does that. And if that's your gut feeling as a customer success executive, do also analyze the right. difficult accounts versus successful accounts based on sales attributes as well so that you can show the difference and can pinpoint some of the issues that you're seeing internally. But I think in your case, it was very clear that, that your gut feeling wasn't like, okay, we have a rogue sales rep, we're actually having an issue defining what is our ideal customer profile. And so the exercise that you went through was perfect. If I may, just one more comment to what you described around the sales process. I think for a bigger sales team and a bigger target market or target account list, one of the things that you can do is also analyze based on segments. So see if you see some systematic problems with a certain segment that you're targeting, and then it will direct you to the right action or the right corrective action. Love that. Okay. Yeah. And so when you finished your exercise, you actually had a lot of information on your hands to create <laughs> or recreate or redefine the ideal customer profile. I bet, did you sit down in a conference room with your marketing team and kind of brainstorm, let's redefine this? Actually, <laughs> I had some idea and I put together an initial suggestion for the team to review together. And 
it ended up the the model that we used and we expanded it a little bit, but not too much. Like I said, it needed to be simple to implement, simple to understand, simple to convey to the team. So we ended up with three main dimensions that in our conversation, we actually mentioned already, but I will say one of them for us was the company size. We are a solution for the larger type of companies, at least right now. We're actually looking at expanding our SCP now that we have so much learnings and we know what are the needs of the other types of accounts. We know what we need to do in order to to expand the ICP. But at that point in time, we wanted to mainly look at the larger mid-size and enterprise companies. The other dimension was what we called tech stack maturity, like I described, like what other tools they have in their marketing stack. Or even before we gave the team, the, the model that we built had very clear scoring. So if they have those tools, it's going to be a score of one. If they have these tools, it's going to be a score of three. And we scored the company size also on just a simple one, two, three scale. The last factor was a bit more subjective, Mm -hmm. and that was easily determined after a discovery call with the customer in the sales process. And we ended up calling it B2B marketing maturity. So not only as it's reflected by the tools that they're using, but also how far along are they in implementing, for example, account-based marketing practices. And that's something that our sales team is proficient in talking to the customers in discovery calls. So again, we gave them guidelines of where the customer is on a simple one, two, three scale. We rated all the customers on this scale, ended up with average scores ranging from zero to three and figure out like where the threshold needs to be. First of all, very impressive that you coached and trained and provided simple guidelines for the sales team on the business maturity that is key to implementing a sophisticated tool like Follows. I think that's awesome. And then you provided guidelines, you documented, you trained the team. And then did you go through an exercise of like leveraging that new score to just test this out and see all right, does it make sense? Do most of our churn customers or unhealthy customers or exactly. are actually getting a lower scores just to validate the exercise? Yeah, so we went back to the same list of customers from the last two years. We rated them on the same dimensions and we looked at the score and we made sure that the threshold for the score that we determine is the right one. And then of course, working with marketing, for them to build the target account list for the sales team based on the dimensions that they can Mm -hmm. control. And then we overlay the other dimensions that are more further into the sales process. Did you give the sales team a goal of a certain score before they close a deal? Like, what did you do with that score? How did that infiltrate into the sales process? We did give them guidance that if The score is below two, if I remember correctly, then they need at least to have a conversation with an executive. So either with VP sales or with me to understand why is that prospect scoring low? Is it something that we can overcome? Is it something that we can offer them maybe another possible channel? So we have options for those accounts but not necessarily at that point in time, not necessarily as a direct sale. Can I ask you, when in the sales process is the sales rep encouraged to provide you the score? Obviously, it's before the deal is closed, but how early? So ideally, early stages. If it's not right after a a discovery call that is done by the ADR, then it's after the first sales call. Mm -hmm. So the deal has to be qualified They think they might close it that quarter and then they're done with their discovery call. So as part of the process of the discovery, they have specific questions to be able to assess the score. And then how do they share the score with you or their sales manager? Is it documented in your CRM system? We don't have it documented well in the CRM system, but I think that the team was so aligned that I feel very lucky saying that, but it it happened naturally. And and I know of specific deals that came to me to discuss 
and validate. So I think we're in our own process maturity today. I would put it as a CRM field and build a flow around it in Salesforce. At that point in time, we, we didn't have that built in, but the team was small enough that we could implement it that way. Okay. So were they able to even close the deal if they did not go through this exercise? Or you felt like this actually happened pretty consistently because you had that partnership and the sales managers or the team managers and the executive were totally in to make sure that we ask the right questions and we understand the maturity of the account going forward as just part of the deal process. Yeah, I think that based on the deals that I was asked to chime in on, there are definitely a few deals that we said, no, we're not going to pursue. And some deals that we found creative ways or made sure that the expectation with the customer was laid out very clearly that this is what they're getting. This is what they're not getting. Is this for them a cause to reverse or not? Mm, I love that because it doesn't mean that now that we have a score, we simply don't get those deals. But what you're really right. saying is that the reason they became bad deals is not only were they not part of our ideal customer profile, but also nobody set different expectations for them to level set right. what they can expect and what they can't expect. So by having that kind of score and a very acute awareness to what is ideal and what is not, we can sort of like revert the sales process. So when we think that there is a bad deal about to happen, like it's not ideal at least, then we have a bit more risk mitigation strategies that we can apply right? yeah, to make absolutely. sure that the customer is successful with us and we can retain them past year one because most SaaS companies, on average, it takes two years before yeah. you recoup the cost of acquisition. And so you definitely want them to be somewhat su successful with you enough to stick around for two or three years. Yeah, absolutely. And I can give you a specific example for this risk mitigation as you describe it. Let's say that they have a tool in their stack that they need integration with, and we don't have this integration and we don't know on our product roadmap, you know how product roadmaps are. It's very hard to predict. We have the conversation with the customer and say, we don't have this integration right now. We can't promise on when we're actually going to have it. How critical it is for you that we have this integration. And if they're saying we're good, if they're saying we're good, after understanding exactly what the implications are for their false deployment of not having this integration, then we can move forward. And we have it documented. We have a call recording to go back to, hopefully not needed, but that's the path forward with those kinds of deals, with just really setting very clear expectations with the customers and with the team. Yeah. And so if you could think about the 100% of deals that would have normally gone rogue, like in past world, before you did this exercise, no one would talk to them about it, maybe overly promise them a certain thing. And then they would go through the implementation, being really disappointed that this integration is not, and then putting a lot of pressure on R&D to deliver something that would be not very beneficial in terms of the roadmap. And so R&D would get pressure, your team will get pressure, the customer experience will be poor, and then they will churn. Versus now you're actually weaving those conversations, resetting expectations, maybe even suggesting some workarounds that is acceptable for them. And yeah, and then everybody's happy, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. I can probably count on, on two hands the number of deals that ended up having those concessions or expectation setting conversations with a customer which means that the gates worked well and only a handful of those ended up even having a conversation about it and then moving forward to an actual deal. And looking at before and after the exercise and educating the sales team on ICP, uh, in ideal customer profile and what would be ideal for the company, what is the major impact that you see now like in terms of how many non-ideal customers and issues with product, like all that stuff that you used to see before, did that completely disappear or like significantly completely like transformed on itself that now it's not even an issue? 
the main achievement for us was that I can probably attribute about 40% reduction in churn to our discipline around ICP, which really made a huge difference since we started implementing it. And I think the entire company is feeling the relief from that because it does put pressure on everyone. It puts pressure on the sales team that need to deal with renewals and, and the tough conversations and it puts pressure on product and it puts pressure on customer success, of course, like the first line. So both on the business side and our and on the overall well-being of the teams, I think it made a significant impact. And like I said, now we're looking at Again, being very disciplined about it, but opening the ICP and allowing more deals to come through those gates now that we know better what are the factors for success and what can make those successful for us today versus like a year ago. So I have a couple of questions. When you put these gates in and say, hey, listen, it's less than two. It's probably not an ideal customer for us. Go find another account or let's have a conversation. But you're starting to let go of some deals. Did you see a decrease in growth in terms of, did it hurt new sales revenues? Was anybody concerned about that? Well, of course, there's a concern about it. And of course, there are some questions. But I think churn is such a toxic metric in a SaaS company that I think that there was a widespread understanding that we need to keep churn under control. And if that's one of the main contributors to churn, then we have to deal with that. So even within the sales teams, they want to have the right conversations with the customer. They want to have to be able to have a successful customer and not get pulled two months after they sold it, get pulled into the conversation. But you said that we have this and we don't. And what do we do now? And so I think that it was a very successful exercise for us. And also, Adi, I think like a mature account executive knows that once they sell a customer a certain tool or a technology and they're hugely successful or they have a good experience, when they move to another company, they're going to want to deal with that person. Even if the sales rep goes to another company and they reach out to that same person, they're going to do business with them again. So you're essentially, as an account executive, you're actually building your poor right. business people that do business with you over time, over the lifespan of your career. So you definitely want to avoid situations where you sell something to an account and then they're like, really like, really, man? Like, you know, you don't want that experience. And I think also for the company, even if it sounds like it's a one step back, two steps forward, because now when I set the expectations correctly, the percentage of accounts in your account base that are going to become advocates is going to shoot up. So immediately you should see your customer satisfaction survey rates go up, possibly NPS. And then if you're proactive about your advocacy, you should see more reviews and referrals. Yeah, absolutely. And we can also make our own processes more streamlined and more, we can get them to value faster because Mm. we know what they expect. They know what to expect and we can run the processes more smoothly. It's a really important point, Adi, and I don't think it's emphasized enough. And I think it's extra important for high growth companies like Follows, where companies sometimes try to expand and capture as much customer base as possible. Then they need to deal with, it's a lot of different engagement models. What if you could just start with one that you can do really well, learn a lot. And like you said, after how many years, a couple of years? You can then expand, Mm -hmm. all right, now we're really good with this, this use case, this customer cohort. What if we expanded on that and come up with another engagement model that would be really good for, because we know that for that cohort, we actually need to do what? More services, different use cases, more integration with R&D. But now that R&D is free because we pretty much stabilize the needs for this most profitable, ideal customer profile, we can get to less ideal and then dedicate some resources to make sure that their customer experience and the outcomes that they get is absolutely the way that the customer expects it. Yeah. I love it as a big takeaway from this exercise Mm -hmm. that focus is really important. Like think about an onboarding specialist or CSM that has to deal with one type of customer, one profile of customer in one meeting, and then right after they deal with something that's very different, 
you lose efficiencies in this scenario. You have a lot of context switches. And for early stage, it's putting a strain on everyone. Right. It can even halt growth to some degree because now everybody's in a reactive mode, sort of trying to put fires out instead of really yeah. being focused on the vision, the strategy, the go-to-market strategy, essentially. The, the, right. the company essentially almost lacks a very focused go-to-market strategy. It's almost like, oh, okay, we cast the net and let's see what we catch. Yeah. That's never, what you're saying is like, don't do that. <laughs> Go do your ICP, focus, fail one, then yeah. do, do something else. Awesome. Well, thinking back, any major takeaways? Like I know a lot of people listen to our video podcasts and they're thinking, oh, well, maybe I should do that too. Any kind of gotchas, things that they should be aware of? What if they don't have an ideal partnership with marketing or sales? What would you recommend them to do? That's a great question because like I said, I was really lucky to have good partnership with the sales team. I think that the way to do it is start for VPs of, of customer success, start with the executive team and show the impact, like the, the negative impact mm -hmm. that churn or bad deals as we call them have on the company. Like there is a cost associated with it. And if you can quantify the cost and show it in terms of churn, in terms of time of sales of CSMs and salespeople that spend with those customers instead of spending them with the customers that can actually expand and be successful. So your alternative cost is skyrocketing because you're losing on so much business that you can do by fighting the fires that those yeah. are creating. So at the end of the day, we're all driven by growth and ARR and revenue. And if we come to the table with showing the negative impact that this is having on our ability to grow, our ability to, to get more revenue, then you'll get the buy-in that you need in order to start the exercise. 100%. I think as usual, you're always full of informative, tactical advice, strategic thinking. It's such a joy to have you on our podcast channel. And I hope everybody that listens to this video also checks out your other video. Just simply <laughs> search your name and you'll, it'll pop up and we'll include the link to the, your other video here on this video description and podcast de description. And it is about how did she tailor customer success packages to actually charge a fee for customer success services, the framework, how she thought about it, the impact, all, all that good stuff. Really great conversation as well, as usual. Thank, thank you so much. You, thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give it a like. Put it in the comments below if you have any questions for ID or what was your main takeaway out of this video? Have you done this kind of exercise and what happened? Or are you thinking about doing it and have some concerns? feel free to comment below. And of course, subscribe to the channel. It helps us a lot and really promotes our YouTube channel to get exposure to other customer success professionals. And with that- Until next time. Exactly. Till next time. I'll see you at the next video.